Welcome to part three, context and commentary. The title of this segment is The Liberation of Man, Breaking the Patriarchal Contract. To the text, it's not about women's lib. It's about the liberation of men and women to be free from the patriarchal contract that pressure society to uphold a mantra that keeps both men and women in a preordained role. Upholding the contract leaves no one free to explore their full potential. Women catering to object roles such as eye candy and men struggling to be machismo are trapped in a performance. The patriarchal contract is inherently a life of living on the surface. While we continue the journey of Marie, here are just a few quotes and stories showing the context for Marie's struggle to live authentically as a scientist. In 1873, E.H. <clears throat> e. Clark wrote in a Sex Education, A Fair Chance for Girls, and this is what he wrote. Higher education for women produces monstrous brains and puny bodies, abnormally active cerebration and abnormally weak digestion, flowing thought, and constipated bowel. Yeah, that's what I said. I just looked again to make sure. Did I read that right? Yes, I did. 1889. The names of 72 Grand Prix recipients are etched in stone on the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower does this as a means of quelling the protests against the tower. Not included is the recipient, Marie Sophie Germain. This is particularly galling since Germain's work explores the elasticity of metal which helped make the construction of the Eiffel Tower possible. The Grand Prix names are engraved on all four sides of the tower in the squares just above the platform above the arch. So if you look at a picture of the Eiffel Tower, you'll see those little square shapes going all the way around all four sides above the first initial arch. And each one of those is engraved with a name, hers being excluded. 1902, Simmons College offers a one-year domestic science program referred to as the Diamond Ring Course. 1903, not allowed to check into a hotel by themselves, women start the Colony Club as a place in New York City to gather or rent a room for the night. 1903 is The Settlement Cookbook by Lizzie Black, and it includes the tagline, The Way to a Man's Heart. The tagline continues at least into the 50s as seen on the cover, and so Next is a picture of the settlement cookbook, and yep, there it is, The Way to a Man's Heart. 1905, former, gov no, former President Grover Cleveland writes this in an article for the Ladies' Home Journal, April 1905. Sensible and responsible women do not want to vote. The relative positions to be assumed by men and women in the work working out of our civilization were assigned long ago by a higher intelligence than ours. Cleveland's letter dated June 26, 1905, informing Ladies Home Journal that, oh, in, he informs the Ladies Home Journal that he is sending the article. In 1910, Vanity Fair cover of Marie and Pierre. And what's wrong with this picture, I ask? So there's a picture of the cover, and it's Marie standing behind Pierre as he's holding a test tube in his hand. She has her hand on his shoulder looking on, again, very much as if, oh, she's the support person. 1929, lie to Lucky and you'll never miss sweets that make you fat. <laughs> it's a Lucky Strikes cigarette advertisement in 1950s. Rules for a stewardess must be five foot two or more, weigh less than 130 pounds, not be married, no children, and they must retire by the age of 32. Most women average just 18 months on the job. The organization, Stewardesses for Women's Rights, is organized in the 1970s, and it forces airlines to change their policies. 
The mandatory retirement age is dropped by the 1980s along with the marriage restriction. Weight restrictions don't end until the 1990s. 1967, women are not allowed to run in the Boston Marathon. It's too far to run for a, quote, fragile woman. So then I have two pictures, and they're quite famous, of Kathy Switzer, who was in the Boston Marathon. She's number 261. Kathy Switzer is the first woman, that's a numbered woman, so to run in the Boston Marathon. Race official Jacques Semple is seen in photo one trying to knock Switzer out of the race. Semple shouts, get the hell out of my race and give me those numbers. And in picture two, right beside it, is number 370, Tom Miller, Switzer's boyfriend, and he's knocking Semple out of the way. It won't be until 1972 that women are officially recognized to participate in the Boston Marathon. 1974, March 4th, 50 women's groups picket the New York Times for their refusal to use the designation Ms. The Times doesn't concede until the mid-1980s. And actually, I, I remember that. I remember when the term Ms. came into being. And, and I must say, at the time, I thought, well, that's really weird. But, you know, I understand it. Again, I'd like to go back to the first, though, the opening of this is these rules are just as much difficult for men. You know, men were also supposed to act a certain way. What if they didn't want to? But there was constraints for them, too. Um, and sometimes women would say, oh, well, it was more to their advantage. And that might be true, but... Uh, you know, everybody should just have an equal shot. Not an equal outcome, but an equal shot. Equal outcome isn't guaranteed. That's, that's, our, that's up to us then. All right, anyway, back to the text. Several men in Marie's life refused to live by the patriarchal contract. Pierre, Vladislav, Dr. Curie, de Bierne, Jean Perrin, Petit, Emile Borel, uh, Gabriel Lippmann, Jacques Kier, and her brother Joseph, and her cousin Joseph. Without their courage to stand up to the traditions of the day, it is doubtful we would have had the advancements to science and society by Marie Curie. So let us move on with Marie's story. Marie is already a member of the Swedish, Dutch, Czech, and Polish Academies, the American Philosophical Society, and the Imperial Academy in St. Petersburg. A few French citizens think it's a little embarrassing that Marie is not yet a member of the French Academy of Sciences. A feminist of the time, Marguerite Durand, writes, The principle of masculine supremacy is going to crumble because nothing justifies it in a time when the power of brains is happily more important than the power of muscles. Durand relates on the feminist perspective, and she says, it isn't admiration that it claims, it's equity. The rebuttal to Duran is not from a man, but from a woman. The journalist, Madame Regnier, answers, quote, One must not try to make of woman the equal of the man. The more we differ from him, the more we are ourselves. The equal of the man, these words alone are terrible. They destroy all that which makes for grace, charm, beauty, fantasy. They abolish all privileges. They ban our tyranny. They give us rights, these famous rights which forbid us to have caprices. Mademoiselle Marie, you must not come become a part of the academies. The most illustrious women of past times who still shine have been the lovers. The most surprising glory is to love and to be loved, and it is by love alone that some women can hope to be numbered one day among the immortals. Marie has no desire to be numbered one day among the immortals, which is a male noun. Marie will be counted as an immortelle, which is then the French version, uh, the female version of the word. And that ends um, the context and commentary. And actually, because it was so short, we'll just go on with chapter eight. And the title of that chapter is When One Considers the Progress. 
It would be nice to finish chapter seven as an end to Marie's grief. As a writer, I don't want to risk boring you with more references to this period in her life. However, if we are to travel this journey of knowing Marie, then we must know the following months continue with near despair. Let us not be akin to the master of ceremonies at Pierre's funeral who hurried Marie to end her time of mourning. In the months following Pierre's death, Bronya is with Marie. One evening in June, Marie asks Bronya to come into her room. Marie is kneeling beside the fire in the fireplace and has a bundle on the floor beside her. As Marie opens the package, Bronya sees the clothes Pierre was wearing the day of the accident. Marie unfolds his shirt, revealing the stains of dried mud and blood. Chips of bone and bits of brain are gruesome and haunting remnants of Pierre. Marie is cutting the clothes into pieces and throwing the scraps into the fire. This is one more step of Marie saying goodbye. She is crying and explains to Bronya, I could not have endured having this touched by indifferent hands. And now tell me, how am I going to manage to live? I know I must, but how shall I do it? How can I do it? These are not rhetorical questions. The cry is in earnest. Tragedy has ripped Marie from a familiar journey to a lonely exile in a foreign place. With no regard for her fragile state of mind, questions are flooding the senses with these startling new realities she must face. Marie writes, I do not have a happy or serene soul by nature, and I latched onto Pierre's sweet serenity in order to find courage, and this source has gone. And this source has gone is a repeating swell of anguish as Marie must face each dimension of her old life that has but been swept away. Marie has lost someone who understood her. Private insecurities, dislikes, frustrations, as well as strength of opinion and insights were safe in Pierre's confidence. Marie, Marie has lost someone who defended her. Pierre believed in her from the beginning of their research when she knew there was an element and decided to find it. In the misogynist world that wanted to deny Marie the Nobel Prize, Pierre pushed back and won. Pierre, who had repeated Marie's name in the Nobel acceptance speech, will never again say Marie's name. She will write his biography, stressing again and again his noble character. She wants the world to know he was a great man of science and a great man of character. And now she must figure out how she will go on without him. At some point she wrote, quote, Before meeting you, I had never met a man like you, and never since then have I seen a perfect as perfect a human being. If I hadn't known you, I would never have known that it was possible to know of it. Jacques writes a gentle note of encouragement to her and says, I hope that you have found the energy to overcome your despondency. You are the center of the little world and your responsibility is great. You must revive and carry on in spite of everything. Marie will revive. You can thank Lord Calvin. In the months following Pierre's death, Calvin is challenging Marie's work. Lord Calvin, who had come to visit Pierre in his lab, who had requested Pierre send copies of his equipment so Calvin himself could use it, who had sat beside Marie while Pierre gave his speech in London, and who had just attended Pierre's funeral, that Lord Calvin. He has published an argument claiming that radium is not an element. To disagree, critique, or question is not what is disturbing. Lord Calvin, world-renowned scientist and a member of science societies, knows that when writing a rebuttal to scientific claims, the statement is to be published in a scientific journal. This puts the article in front of a jury of peers who have an educated eye to evaluate the merits of the argument. Instead, Calvin uses his name slash influence, has his rebuttal printed in the Times of London. Capturing the frenzy of radium, Calvin states that the radium is only a compound of lead and helium. 
He claims the Curies made a mistake in calling this a new element and implies the Curies did not deserve the Nobel Prize. If this is true, the Curies' work is nothing. The backstory for Calvin making this claim, if the Curies' work on radium is true, it contradicts Calvin's work. Calvin has previously, previously stated that the age of the earth is 20 million years old. Marie's work makes Calvin's proclamation incorrect. Ernest Rutherford defends the Curie's work and challenges, challenges Calvin with an article in the publication Nature. Marie doesn't respond to Lord Calvin with a written dispute. She goes to the laboratory and will crush the debate there. Marie, the woman who sifted through tons of pitch blend and extracted a quarter teaspoon of radium, now reclaims from the ashes of her life the will to follow Pierre's directive. One must work just the same. To refute Calvin's claim against findings of their research, Marie must produce a perfectly pure metallic radium sample. Marie is back in the laboratory. With de Beeren's help, the work will take three years and the result is a tiny square of shiny white metal. Marie explains, it has never been repeated because it involves a serious danger of loss of radium, which can be avoided only with utmost care. At last I saw the mysterious white metal, but I could not keep it in this state for it was required for further experiment. This experiment is so difficult, it has never been repeated. Lord Calvin won't be able to apologize. One year after his allegations, he dies. As for Marie, some critics had also doubted polonium, so she puts that argument to rest also. Marie and de Beeren produce enough polonium to identify that it is indeed its own element. In 1906, a scholarship fund to support the Curie's research is set up by Andrew Carnegie. Mr. Carnegie does not want the scholarship in his own name. It will be called the Curie Foundation. He stipulates that Marie is to be given full control. Marie uses the funds to recruit student scientists, men and women, from around the world to come and study under her direction. The grace and generosity of Marie's character, character will reach as far as China. At the Temple of Confucius, at Taiwan Fu, I'm sorry, T A I Y U A N dash F U. There is a portrait of Marie hanging as one of the benefactors of humanity. Alongside her portrait are Descartes, Newton, the Buddhas, and the emperors of China. November 5, 1906. Marie is scheduled to start teaching her class at the Sorbonne. It's an historic moment. She is the first woman to ever lecture from these glorified halls. A crowd is packing the auditorium by noon. Marie's lecture is not scheduled to start until 1.30. Most of the audience are gawkers and won't understand the class, but they will be able to claim, I was there. Marie is not at the Sorbonne. Marie is at the cemetery in Sco, standing by Pierre's grave. Is Marie reminiscing that a mere 15 years ago she was crossing the Sorbonne courtyard for the first time? Does Marie murmur to Pierre the memory from three years earlier when they had ridden their bicycles to the Sorbonne on the day she gave her doctoral defense? Now she must go to the Sorbonne alone. Her journal entries are empty. For this private moment at Pierre's tombstone, Marie is silent. Customarily, the first day of class is opened by the Dean of Faculty, Paul Appel, introducing the new person to hold the chair. Included in the introduction is a small speech extolling the previous chair person. Marie has requested that Appel make no mention of Pierre and instead simply introduce her. Crowds unable to fit in the grand hall are spilling down the corridors. The audience includes Sorbonne students, and Marie's students from her school, the Severs. 
the Polish community has turned out as an expression of pride in their fellow Pole. Irene and Dr. Curie are in the sea of faces. Photographers are ready with their cameras pointed at the grand entrance. Journalists have pencils poised to describe the moment when Marie extols a tearful tribute to her belated husband. Marie does not come in through the usual door. She enters through a side door. With heads cranked in the wrong direction, most of the spectators don't even notice that Marie, wearing her usual black dress, is already at the lecture table. As, un as unassuming as her entrance, Marie does not succumb to any desire for attention or playing to the audience's petty expectations. She starts her lecture in a poignant, quiet voice at the exact point in the notes where Pierre had left off. And she says, when one considers the progress that has been made in physics in the past 10 years. The room is transfixed in this noble moment. Do they comprehend how perfectly poignant is the scene? Marie's voice is breathing life into Pierre's notes. When Marie finishes her lecture, the crowd erupts into applause. Marie collects her notes and leaves through the side door. After the first day, Marie writes in her journal, You would have been happy to see me as a professor at the Sorbonne, and I myself would have so willingly done it for you. But to do it in your place, my Pierre, could one dream of a thing more cruel? I really feel that all my will to live is dead in me, and I only have my duty to bring up my children and also to continue on the path I have accepted. Perhaps also the wish to prove to the world, and especially to myself, that the one that you have loved so much really has some value. I also have the vague hope that you might know about my life of pain and effort, and that you would be grateful, and so that I might perhaps find you more easily in the other life, if there is one. And then Marie adds, Tomorrow I will be 39. When Marie expresses the desire to prove to the world her value, the proving will need to be to women as well as men. Women have a vested interest in not wanting an example to be available to themselves or their daughters of how they too can reach for the stars. A few months after Marie's first lecture at the Sorbonne, a popular novelist, Colette Yvert, has a book release entitled Princess of Science. It is a huge success and is awarded by an all-female panel, the Pre-Femina Award. <clears throat> and here's the storyline. The heroine is a doctor's daughter who becomes a doctor and practices medicine. All seems to be going well. She marries and has a child. Tragedy hits when the cook quits and collars and the collars of her husband's shirts are not properly starched. The drama ramps up when their infant child dies, and then the inevitable demise of every woman who would dare to have a life. Her husband runs off to the arms of another woman. The heroine comes to her senses, realizes she should not try to live up to what her father wants, and instead live the traditional role of a mother and wife. And that's what the book was about. This is the societal backlash that Marie is facing with no Pierre at her side. Marie is once again consumed with her work in the laboratory. Staying late into the night, she is returning to the lab early each morning. She is completing experiments Pierre had been pursuing for his book. Marie writes the second half of the manuscript and gives no credit to herself for the 600-page book entitled Works of Pierre Curie. Neglecting her health, Marie can't keep up this pace. When she faints and falls in the laboratory, her family is called. Eve writes later, Jacques and Marie's, Jacques and Marie's brother and sister, Joseph and Bronya, observed with terror the movements of this black-robed woman. The autom automaton Marie had become stiff, absent-minded, the wife who had not joined the dead, seemed already to have abandoned the living. 
For Irene, there are nights she wakes up from nightmares and is worried that her mother might be dead too. Eve remembers seeing her mother staring into space, or another time she sees her mother collapse. A step out of this fog of grief is when Marie decides to move from her house in Paris. Dr. Curie, the girls, a Polish housekeeper, and Marie move to Sco. For the back garden of their new house, Marie has, a gymna has gymnastic equipment built for Irene and Eve. The daily regimen of the daughters includes exercise and swimming lessons. The girls go for hikes, take bicycle trips, and learn to ride a horse. They also learn to cook and sew, and when they each turn 11, they are allowed to walk the streets by themselves. The tragedy of their father's death does not make Marie an overprotective mother. Instead, Marie insists her daughters be able to live independent lives when they grow up. Irene writes about those years. My mother tried to give us every chance to exercise. We swam, rode, and skated. We did gymnastics, cycling, and riding on horseback. Regarding thunderstorms, she got us interested in what thunderstorms consisted of, teaching us, for example, to count the number of seconds which elapsed between the lightning and the thunder's noise. This enabled us to estimate. I suppose her own daily behavior was that is what influenced us. She had always taken chances to accomplish what she intended to do, and she was not, by nature, a prudent person." End quote. Marie, although a working single mom, has family support. Bronia suggests a sister-in-law from Poland come to live with Marie in the role of a governess for the girls. Not only does this keep the children surrounded with loving family, it ensures the girls learn to speak Polish. Dr. Curie, his serene spirit, is a peaceful presence in the house. He is the one to talk with the girls and tell them stories about their father. Marie will always find it too painful to talk about Pierre. Providing the girls with a semblance of standing in for their father, Eve writes of their grandfather. He would talk <coughs> and laugh, and he was absolute joy to the children, especially Irene, whom he understood so well because she was so much like her father, his son. The summer of 1906, when Irene is away visiting friends, Dr. Curie writes to her. My, <clears throat> oh, he writes to Irene. Let me clarify that. So this is what he writes to Irene. My dear Irene, my dear big grandchild, this letter is from Eve and is a thank you for your postcards. I think you will recognize her style. And he writes the sounds, E-U, 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 E-U. <laughs> Later, Irene sends her grandfather a letter and she signs the letter, Your little Irene of nothing at all. <sighs> grandfather writes back, No, you are not a little Irene of nothing at all. You are my big Irene, Irene of everything. I'm sorry. My big Irene of six slices of bread and butter who would smother a little Irene of nothing at all. <laughs> what a beautiful thing. Within the family circle is Andre de Bjorn. Continuing as Marie's assistant, he visits on Sundays bringing treats for the girls. Eve delights in drawing pictures with Andre, and Irene wants to do algebra problems. The difference between the girls are clear. Marie writes to Eve, writes of Eve. She begins at three years and four months to pick out a tune on the piano. It's the uh, Claire de Lune song. At four years, she knows how to play around 30 airs and songs. Marie later asks Paderewski to listen to Eve play, wanting to know if he thinks Eve has an exceptional ability. Marie writes in her journal, I had intuition about it. I, who understand nothing of music, I felt very much that she didn't play like just anyone. For Irene, it is abundantly clear that her talent is math, not music. Irene will later be asked if Marie forced her to pursue science. Irene gives this response, that one must do some work seriously and must be independent, 
and not merely amuse oneself in life. This our mother has told us always, but never that science was the only career worth following. Marie is determined to see that her daughter's education is nothing short of exceptional. She expresses her misgivings about regular school in a letter to, to her sister, Hella. I sometimes have the feeling that it would be better to drown the children than to shut them up in the sort of schools we have now. Marie devises, <clears throat> end of quote, Marie devises a plan for not only her daughters, but also the children of several professors of the Sorbonne. Marie arranges that each professor has one day of the week to teach the children. Thursday is Marie's day to teach science to the young students. She sets up experiments for them to learn through experiences. Challenging their critical thinking skills, Marie asks the children how to keep a pan of boiling water hot. After several elaborate answers, Marie demonstrates the simple answer. She places a lid on the pot. Marie insists her students keep the same standard for a clean laboratory as her adult students. She scolds them. Don't tell me you will clean it afterward. One must never dirty a table during an experiment. And Marie instills other life lessons too. She tells the children, you must get so that you never make a mistake. The secret is in not going too fast. In the continual struggle Marie has with the media, when the press gets wind of the classes for the children, they spin a story. One article reads, quote, This little company, which hardly knows how to read or write, has permission to make manipulations to engage the experiments, the Sorbonne <clears throat> to engage in experiments. The Sorbonne has not exploded yet, but all hope is not yet lost. End quote. Yes, it is hoped this deviation from the norm explodes, so the experiment fails and society will not be challenged. The Sorbonne isn't blown up by careless children, although time constraints of the professors force the classes to come to an end after two years. As Irene and Eve continue to grow, they share a love of literature, just as Marie had with her siblings. The family tradition of women being financially responsible also continues. This is still a novel idea for women. Eve remembers Marie instilling, quote, an instinct of independence which conceived, I'm sorry, which convinced us both that in any combination of circumstances, we should know how to get along without help. Infusing an instinct of independence includes Marie's indifference to money, materialism, and social protocols. Marie abides by each style of her daughters. For Eve, Marie sees the outgoing people person who enjoys fashion and uses her natural charm. Marie knows that Irene is content with a book or the solitude of the laboratory. Irene doesn't see the need to greet people, so she doesn't. As, an under, as understanding as any mother can be, there are still days with her children. Marie is tutoring Irene at home for entrance exams to a school. A parent trying to teach their own child is usually not a good idea. When Irene is distracted and doesn't answer a math problem quickly, Marie takes Irene's notebook and throws it out the window. Irene, like her father, is unperturbed. Irene gets up, walks downstairs, and goes outside and retrieves the notebook. Going back inside, Irene marches up the stairs, sits down, and answers the question. And there are ways that Marie's style is not what is best for the girls. Marie keeps the mood of the house calm and never raises her voice. This is fine for Irene, but this is not what I, Marie, Eve needs. Eve later writes that Marie, quote, would not allow anybody to raise their voice, whether in anger or in joy, end quote. During Eve's growing years, Marie is in her 40s and struggling with the balance of home and work. Eve writes of Marie, In spite of the help my mother tried to give me, my young years were not happy ones. End quote. A frustration both daughters experience is they must share their mother. The demands of teaching and being world famous take Marie away from home. Irene is annoyed when a female student comes to visit for tea. 
Irene tells Marie, you must take notice of me. It's funny in the other two books about Eleanor Roosevelt and Golda Meir, the children, it's quite noted, you know, the children suffered the same thing. It's very hard to share a parent with the public. And, and I think especially for as a mother, uh, you feel that more deeply or it's tougher for the children, certainly. Anyway, back to the text. When the three are apart, though, there are daily letters going back and forth. While the letters usually describe the simple details of life, on one such occasion, Irene, though, writes to her mother and says, When it rains, I think that these dark moments spent waiting for light would be much nicer if you were here in a chair next to me. And when I see the sunshine in the sky and make beautiful reflections on the water in the streams, I think that everything would be much, much nicer with my sweet May. And that's the girl's pet name for their mother is May, M-E. Where <clears throat> would be nicer with, if my sweet May were there near to me to look at them. And that ends chapter 8. Thank you.